Wow, what a fabulous start to our program today. The University Singers. And we're so fortunate to hear more throughout the program. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm Lisa German, University Librarian and Dean of the Libraries, and it is so great after all this time, to see you all in person. This is our first in-person Friends event since January of 2020, more than a month before I started here as Dean. The last time we held our Friends Appreciation event was in December of 2019 in this very theater. Let me just say thank you. Thank you, we could not have provi provide this melodic appreciation of your support without the help of our many friends and partners. We have a wonderfully supportive board of the Friends of the Libraries, and I'm happy to acknowledge that many of them have joined us here today. Would all the current and former board members please stand? I'd also like to acknowledge our former dean, Wendy Luger, who's here today with her husband, Mike. Wendy. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to our just wonderful staff who have arranged everything for today. Bradley Greenwald, for instance, is a full-throated and kind-hearted musician. We are so fortunate to have him on our friends board and co-chairing our events committee for the past six years. He can sing, write, act, and direct theater productions too. 
Thank you, Bradley, for sharing your talents with all of us today. Again, I'm so glad you chose to gather with us to enjoy the voices of these talented singers, all of whom study in our renowned University of Minnesota School of Music. Today, they are led by Matthew McAfee, University of Minnesota Professor of Music. Later in the program, our music librarian, Jessica Abasio, will introduce um, our music library and talk about its critical role in supporting students, the university music program, the friends, and the community. Many of the songs performed today have not been heard for more than 100 years. Some have never been performed publicly. So we're in for a unique treat this afternoon. As you might expect, this concert program has ties to the libraries. The musical scores are archived digitally by the university libraries and are available on the English Heritage Music Series website, which was created in partnership with our library publishing services staff. The publishing services team works closely with faculty and researchers in the creation of scholarly journals and open textbooks. These open textbooks reduce costs for the University of Minnesota students and are freely available to anyone around the world. Now I'd like to share an acknowledgement that is relevant and important to all of us. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education to American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. And now, to serve as our MC for this afternoon, please welcome Bradley Greenwald. Good afternoon, my name is Bradley Greenwald, co-chair of the events committee. Uh, I have a question. The first piece that was sung by the university singers, how many of you have heard that before? All right, good. None of you because most of the music that you will hear this afternoon has never been performed in front of an audience. Uh, but thanks to the inspired work of some people that you are going to be meeting this afternoon, uh, all of the music that you'll be hearing this afternoon has been rediscovered from archives. Uh, it's been engraved, published, and is now available for performance for the first time ever, for free. Proof to me, again, that the modern library with its constant reinventing to meet new ideas and social needs is truly one of the most miraculous and humane human inventions ever. So let's get on with it. Uh, please welcome one of my most favorite people in the entire world, University Choral Professor Matthew Mahaffey. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Mahaffey, and I'm a professor of music here at the University of Minnesota, and one of two faculty members here who directs choirs. It's my pleasure to be here today to speak with you about the English Heritage Music Series. This project was spearheaded and led by my friend Dave Fielding, who will be sharing uh, a lot of detail about this today with you. Uh, but this series has been an endless source of curiosity and creative inspiration for me and has really altered the trajectory of my own musical career. But before Dave tells you about the series specifically, I thought it would be wise to give you a little bit of background about where all of this music comes from. By the end of the Industrial Revolution in England and during the height of the Victorian era, English culture and specifically English music was enjoying a renaissance. 
Civic and cathedral choirs were very popular activities for the newly formed middle class and were supported by both the church and the throne. Choirs needed repertoire to sing, and English composers, which we see a whole bunch of them up here, um, were happy, more than happy to provide new music for these, for these choirs. A first generation of composers uh, of this English musical renaissance include names that maybe you've heard of before, Charles Stanford, Charles Perry, and Edward Elgar. Their success and creativity led to a second generation of composers which included Rafe von Williams and Gustav Holst. Cities and towns throughout England would host immense days-long choral festivals that would attract singers. And you can uh, see, sorry, from this sketch here that these were very popular events. This is a picture, if you can't read from the audience, of the Birmingham Musical Festival from 1873 in their town hall. And you can see the, the large choir and orchestra up on the stage and the huge number of people in, in the audience. On the right-hand side of this slide is a detail of a uh, festival from 1891. And you'll see it was a three-day festival. Choirs came from around the country from different churches and, and towns and performed with and for one another. Uh, you'll see on Tuesday, they performed uh, Mendelssohn's uh, Oratorio St. Paul, uh, which is a, at, at the time, was one of Mendelssohn's most popular compositions. It's a piece that is, today is performed less often. On Wednesday, they performed Mozart's Requiem. I, I bet if, if you watch TV, you can't go 10 commercials without hearing something from Mozart's Requiem, it seems. Uh, Beethoven's Symphony Eroica, number three. Uh, and then here's one of the, the gentleman I mentioned before, Stanford, a uh, Te Deum. John Stainer was a popular composer at this time. And then another Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was very, very popular um, in England, um, even now at this point, about fifth, close to 50 years after his death. Uh, and then on Thursday, uh, the second one down is the one I really want to point out to you. This is the Charles Hubert Hastings Perry De Profundis. And this was the world premiere of the De Profundis. You're going to hear a lot about this piece today, and you'll even hear about how the English Heritage Music Series uh, brought this piece back from sitting on a library shelf to all the way to the point where it was performed last month in England uh, with full chorus and orchestra. So what would happen is the composers I mentioned or, or others would be commissioned to write a new work for these festivals. The work would be handwritten by the composer uh, into what would be known as the full score. And we'll, you'll, you'll have an opportunity afterwards to see uh, actual physical representations of these. But a full score is something that's used by a conductor and it would have all of the parts written on it. If there was a, a choir, the choir notes would be there. If there was a flute and a violin or a harp or whatever, it's all on one page and kind of flows from left to right uh, and you read it that way. Uh, Copies would then be made from this full score of any necessary performance materials. So for instance, a violinist doesn't need to see the full score, they only need to see the violin part. So people would take the full score and hand copy uh, instrumental parts and also parts for singers and choir. Uh, after the premiere of a work like De Profundis, a publisher, uh, in England, two of the big ones were Novello and Boozy and Hawks. Uh, they would gather all of the handwritten materials, the parts and, and the full score, and put them on a shelf in their warehouse ready to be rented out again. The English term for this is hired out. Um, so you, you'll read in a lot of music cata musical catalogs, it'll say that the parts are available for hire. Some of these pieces went on to become well-known, often performed oratorios. Um, one of these choral festival oratorios that still is performed today and was performed by the Minnesota Orchestra just a few years ago is Elgar's Dream of Gerontius. But a piece like De Profundis, which you'll hear a little bit of, is a magnificent piece, sat on the shelf for years and years and years and was not performed again. Uh, eventually, the composers, uh, or excuse me, the, the publishers were, were decided they needed to clear out some of their warehouse and they ended up selling these parts or these materials to different libraries. And it's from there that our story begins. So to make a long story short, um, a lot of these parts, they got put on shelves, never to be performed again. Um, 
and we had to f we had to find them, and that's until Dave came along. Uh, many of the new p pieces in our series were pieces that I learned about in school. I read about them on a list, but I was never able to hear them. Now, thanks to the English Heritage Music series, these pieces are now engraved in modern usable materials that can be accessed worldwide and printed for free to be used in performance. We also hope to add recordings of these performances to the website uh, so they, when they are performed and given new life. Today you're gonna hear several pieces performed that haven't been heard in over 100 years. And some, to the best of our knowledge, may be receiving their premier performance right here in Minnesota. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend Dave Fielding to tell you more about the process he undertook to create these editions. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, help me get oriented here. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, now that Matthew has provided us with a historical look at choral music in late Victorian England, I want to give you some background on the series, what it is, how it came about, and what our mission is. We'll also show you, uh, as Lisa mentioned, how the University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing Services has played an essential role in the development and the success of the series. And finally, as mentioned and promised, we'll share some more music from the series, music which I'm confident you'll be hearing for the first time. English choral music has always been an important part of my life. In my youth, I lived in northern New Jersey, and it was convenient to take trips on Sunday afternoon into Manhattan to visit the Episcopal services at St. Thomas Church, St. Bartholomew's Church. And throughout my working career, as we moved around the country, I had the privilege to sing in cathedral choirs in Miami and Atlanta and here in Minneapolis in the St. Mark's Choral Series. My connection with that music has always been as a singer. But as I looked toward retirement, and as my singing voice began to show the signs of age that inevitably occur, I started to look for other ways to remain connected to this music. The motivation to create what has now become the English Heritage Music Series began back in 2008 when I was a singer at St. Mark's. Ray Johnston, the choral director there, was planning an all Vaughan Williams concert and he asked me to see if I could find a work to be included on the program, which was unique. So I turned to Michael Kennedy's biography of the composer, a biography that at the uh, back contains a complete inventory of everything that the composer wrote throughout his life. And among the listings, I was shocked to find that there was a four-movement work from 1894 by the composer based on the Latin hymn tune Vexilla Regis, which was shown as being unpublished and unperformed. It was composed by the uh, Vaughan Williams uh, as an academic exercise in fulfillment of his bachelor's degree requirements at Cambridge and it was considered an academic exercise and therefore not necessary to perform. So we contacted the Vaughan Williams Trust in England, and as you might imagine, it was not easy to extract permission to uh, prepare performance scores and to perform the work, but Ray Johnston uh, was a former uh, associate organist at Hereford Cathedral, and I think his British accent served us well. We were provided with the score. Uh, we presented the world premiere of Vaughan Williams' Vexilla Regis in May 30th of 2009 at St. Mark's Cathedral. And you should know that the soprano soloist in that premiere was none other than Christy Berglund, the music metadata librarian here at the university. The thrill of working with music scores in the hand of a noted English composer for a work that had never been performed was truly a life-changing experience for me. 
That experience led to tracking down additional manuscripts in British libraries, which we were able to later perform here in town by the Augsburg Masterworks Chorus under the leadership of Peter Hendrickson, including Patrick Hadley's Lenten Meditations and John Ireland's Psalm 42. And then my life changed again. In 2013, I met Matthew. And Matthew was getting ready to present uh, a uh, program uh, based on music from the time, the period uh, that was being shown in the uh, popular PBS series, Downton Abbey. And I had some music that he needed. So between the two of us, we set about uh, putting that program together, and you see the uh, uh, vocal score, at least, cover up there. That uh, performance was so popular that we immediately scrambled and put a second performance together. And then we went about and put a Christmas version together for that very same year. It was at this point that I resolved that English choral music archaeology would be a full-time effort for me in retirement. The first formal engraving that I undertook was Hubert Perry's 1891 setting of Psalm 130 De Profundis, which Matthew referred to. This was a tough one. Unlike most of the manuscripts from this period, the autograph manuscript for De Profundis was not in a library. It was held by Perry's great-granddaughter, uh, Laura Ponsonby, uh, in a place in West Sussex called Shulbrood Priory. Very British. Well, I contacted her, and fortunately, she was accommodating and provided me with a Xerox copy of this score. Extremely difficult to uh, read. I mean, it goes back to 1891, uh, but nevertheless, it was manageable. And so I set out to prepare the performance material to be able to listen to this work as Perry intended for the first time. I produced a full set of performance scores, uh, and when I hit the play button uh, on that piece, uh, it's never been the same for me. It was magical. I sourced and created performance scores for four more of Perry's large oratorios. But as the number of newly engraved scores began to grow, it became apparent that no matter how hard I worked on the engraving process, that unless there was a way to make them available to people uh, on a worldwide basis, that my dream of resurrecting this music and facilitating live performance would be difficult, probably impossible. But fortunately, there was a solution, and that solution was the University of Minnesota and its library publishing services. In February of 2020, with support from Matthew and Jessica Abasio, we submitted a proposal to create an open access website for the publication and downloading of these scores. Our proposal was accepted in late March and working over the course of the next 12 months, we put together the English Heritage Music Series website. Since then, in just one year, the website has grown to include 16 composers and provides access to over 80 compositions ranging from a minute and a half part song a cappella to full oratorios for soloists, chorus, and orchestra, which run for over an hour and a half. And the work continues. This morning before I came here, I put the uh, starting effort into Act Two of Stanford's three-act dramatic oratorio based on the Robert Bridges poem, Eden. When complete, that work will probably take well over two hours to perform. And we have additional works in queue. So we promised you some music, and we're going to deliver on that promise. 
Hubert Perry was at the center of English music during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The composition which launched his career in 1887 was entitled Blessed Pair of Sirens, based on John Milton's ode at a solemn music. He's also known for his anthem, I Was Glad, which has been used as an anthem at every English coronation since Edward VII, and the tune Jerusalem, which closes the proms concerts every year. Perry was a professor of musical history upon the opening of the new, at the time, Royal College of Music, and he succeeded the college's first director, George Grove, in 1895, serving in that position until his death in 1918. Please welcome soprano Jameen Lee and Yichin Liang at the piano for a performance of the third movement from Hubert Perry's De Profundis. Thank you. 
settle in for a bit. Each composition in the English Heritage Music Series undergoes a three-step process. First, we have to source it, find it, put our hands on it. Then we can engrave it. And now, with the help of the university, we can publish it. Ultimately, our hope is that access to these scores will inspire conductors and performers throughout the world to resurrect these forgotten works. I'd like to take you through some of the details associated with these steps. Sourcing, as it should be no surprise, because this is English music. These are English libraries, and the primary libraries for these scores are shown here. The Royal College of Music is the largest uh, in terms of the inventory uh, of scores, but we do uh, and have received scores from the Bodleian Library at Oxford, uh, Trinity College, and the University of Cambridge Library, and even the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, these libraries have been incredibly supportive. When we first started, the usual process when you'd make a request for a manuscript scan, these are all digital scans, uh, you would be paying on a per page basis and not inexpensive. Uh, I think it's up to about three and a half pounds a page now. Uh, and these are large scores. But because of what we're doing, with the Royal College of Music, for example, everything that we request is provided free of charge because they know that by getting this music back out, uh, that it can provide uh, interest in their library holdings far beyond everything that we do. We can find it. There are composer biographies and online internet searches and so on, but it's not always easy to put your hands on the scan. And Alan Gray, this is a good example of a problem that we faced. Alan Gray was a, an organist at Trinity College, Cambridge. He succeeded Stanford, and he was the organist there for over 30 years. Tall man, I think they said he was 6'7", I can't imagine a an organist with legs that long, but he must have had a few blocks under the bench. Um, he had three sons. His two oldest sons uh, enlisted and were in the Great War. Uh, and sadly, they were both killed in the final year of the war. Uh, Edward, within three months of the armistice. So in his grief, Gray composed a setting of the Requiem in memoriam to those two sons. That record is on the college, or on the uh, listing for Cambridge University Library. You can find it. You can give them the search number. The problem is that under UK copyright law, because it was never engraved, because it's never been published and never performed, it wouldn't flow into the public domain until the year 2039. And I just couldn't uh, imagine a work of this significance sitting silent any longer. So I asked the folks at the Cambridge University Library what my options might be. And they said, well, if you can do a sufficient research of the genealogy of the Gray family and prove to us that uh, there are no heirs, and there's no estate that governs the Gray family, uh, then you can apply for what they call an orphan works license. And that then gives the library the permission to scan and provide us with that scan. So I spent the better part of last summer conducting that search, and fortunately, it turned out that uh, uh, we, we could meet the requirements, and that license was granted. Uh, the score was prepared, and uh, we are about ready to put it up on the website. If you went there today, you wouldn't find it. Uh, we've been 
trying to hold off in publishing it uh, simply because uh, of the significance to Cambridge University. We wanted to give them right of first refusal on the uh, world premiere. Gray's Requiem is scored for a quartet of soloists, mixed chorus, and orchestra and organ. And while I apologize that we couldn't bring those resources here today, the music is nonetheless just as powerful and beautiful with piano accompaniment. So to the memory of Edward and Morris Gray, soprano soloist Nadia Franson and the university singers now perform for the very first time the Lacrimosa from Alan Gray's Requiem.
So once we have our hands on the manuscript, we have to get it into the computer. Engraving uh, process back in the 16th century was quite a bit different than what exists today. Uh, plates, pewter generally, copper sometimes, had to be scribed and inscribed. And ink had to be filled into those grooves and paper then used to transfer the image. Fortunately, in the 1980s, with the advent of computers, and software began to be developed. Notation took on a digital solution. And today, there are three very good, although if you talk to the folks that use it, they all have very strong opinions about which one they prefer. Uh, there are three good options to use. We use Finale, uh, and uh, I wouldn't want to change. But as convenient as that software is, it's very time consuming. Because not only do you have to make the entries into the computer, the first thing you have to do is look at the score and try to understand the handwriting that's in some cases up to 140 years old. And of course, as Matthew mentioned, the, those manuscripts were hired out and every conductor that had a chance to touch one uh, put a lot of marks on it. Blue pencils, red pencils, cross outs, notes to self. <laughs> and all of that is on these scores and so you have to weed through all of that in order to figure out then what the note value is, uh, the articulation, did he really mean an accent on this or is that just a blob of ink? So it takes an incredible amount of time to complete a score. It's not uncommon for me to take an hour, hour and a half to do one page. Nevertheless, as I mentioned earlier, when you finally get to the point of completion and you hit that play button, that time is well worthwhile, and I'm sorry here we've got a, a little uh, error on my part. There we go. My apologies. In the summer of 1848, Robert Browning and his wife traveled to Fano, Italy, hoping that the cool sea breeze of the east coast of Italy would provide a respite from the stifling heat that they had experienced in Florence. Sadly, they found in Fano that it was even hotter. And looking for some shade, they entered the church of San Agostino and discovered a large painting depicted here to the right. In that church, and the painting was entitled The Guardian Angel by a 17th century artist known as Guarcino. When the Brownings returned to their hotel, Robert composed a poem inspired by that painting, which he titled, The Guardian Angel, A Picture at Fano. English composer Granville Bantock set three verses from Browning's poem in 1920. Please welcome Bradley Greenwald with each in uh, Liang and piano for a performance of Granville Bantock's The Guardian Angel.
sit all the day here, that when Eve shall find before thy special ministry, and time come for departure, thou suspending thy flight, mayst see another child for tending, another still to quiet and retreat. Then I shall feel thee step one step. Suddenly, my head is covered o'er with those wings, quite above the child who prays now on that tomb. And I shall feel thee guarding me out of all the world for me discard. Yon heaven thy home that waits and opes its So after the engraving process went for so many pieces and we had a large collection, Dave and I knew we wanted to put this music out there for the world to use. There were already open source options available where we could have posted the music, places like uh, the International Score Library Project, IMSLP, or the Choral Public Domain Library. These are websites full of music that is in the public domain. But we didn't want to necessarily relinquish the ability to connect with the performers and also be able to ask for recordings after each um, piece was premiered for the first time. 
So we approached the library and came up, uh, as Dave mentioned, with the English Heritage Music Series website. The team at the library was incredible to work with, uh, kind of walking us through every step, de developing the website, providing the storage for all of the data, uh, and uh, every step, you know, we kept working together and we are so pleased with the product that we came up with. This was also the library's first ever music publication, so they were taking a big risk uh, and venturing into that new territory, and for that we are very grateful. I did want to take a second to show you what the website looks like. It's going to take me a moment to click, oops, into the site here. So through the library site, you would come to a web, a homepage like this where all of the composers are listed. And we can click on any of these composers. If we find Perry here, we can go um, into here. And these are all of the different pieces that are up on the website. So if I come down to De Profundis, which is what we heard before, you click on De Profundis, and it will open this entire record here. So there's a whole bunch of metadata that is here telling what the, where the text comes from, when it was composed, uh, the, the length, the instrumentation. These numbers mean uh, to a conductor in score order that there are two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, a bass clarinet, two bassoons, a, a, bass, a contrabass bassoon, 4321 is in the brass, timpani, organ, and strings. So this is a huge um, group. Uh, so you would then be able to download the, the full score. And I can, if I take quickly what this looks like, you open up and there's a whole bunch of background material about the, each, about the series, the text. Um, and then here you would see, this is what Dave has created here from the manuscript. So you'll see all of the f flute, oboe, clarinet, parts, and so on. This one's actually for three choirs, 12-part choir. So it's quite, a, quite an undertaking just to put that all in. And then from there, the software will extract um, this. That makes it sound very easy, a very time-consuming process. But you can, uh, you can take and get now just the flute part here. So if, if I wanted to know what the flute plays, um, we, an orchestra would be able to print this out and hand this to the flute player. And this is the flute one part. So for all of these pieces, there's all of this material, um, and each one is unique. Uh, so just that's kind of what a, a typical record looks like. I want to show you one other thing while I have it on here. Um, if we went, for instance, I know it's on this one. Our next composer we're going to hear from is Samuel Coleridge Taylor. But if I click on to one of these, you can, and many of these, we've uploaded the actual scan of the manuscript. So I can hear on view autograph manuscript. And this is what it looks like at the beginning. So you see there the blue marks, the red, temp, the red pencils. But you can see how difficult this is to read. So this is what Dave is deciphering. I mean, I don't even know what that says. <laughs> so I think it's a tempo. Is that what it is, Dave? Yeah. Uh, so meaning back to the original tempo. Um, so. In many cases, if we have the scan of the manuscript, it is also available uh, on the website. Which then, if there's, a, if you go back and you, um, you know, somebody who performs this and they want to uh, check something, they can go back and look at the original source material. Maybe because we're sure that maybe Dave, maybe he made one mistake in one of those, right? But as a composer, we found one in one of the scores, you know, the first time that we put it together, you know, oh, that note isn't quite right, and then you can go back to the manuscript and go, oh, he put an E in there instead of a D, and then we can fix that, and then we re-upload the score. Uh, so that's a little bit about how it is engraved and then on into publishing. Uh, and now, choir, I'm going to have you come up, and we're going to perform our next piece. Samuel Coleridge Taylor is sometimes referred to as the Black Mahler. He was a prolific composer who completed over 80 opus numbers in his brief 37 years. The English uh, Heritage Music Series uh, has recently completed the engraving of Coleridge Taylor's 1903, The Atonement, which is a 90-minute sacred cantata which tells the passion story in a completely unique way. 
The last known performance of this epic work was in 1904 in Manhattan. With those scores now in hand, we hope that future grant funding will provide the resources required to perform and record this work. A bit smaller in scale, but a beautiful example of the composer's skill, university singers now perform Coleridge Taylor's Requiescat, setting of a Matthew Arnold poem by the same title. I think as we mentioned, the ultimate goal of the series is to unearth from the past and preserve for the future, but music scores exist for one purpose, performance. So imagine our excitement last summer when after only six months since the website was launched, we were contacted by David Temple, who is the music director of the Herefordshire Choir in the UK. He was putting together a program for a, a concert in February of this year, and he wanted to uh, do lesser known works by Edward Elgar and Hubert Perry. 
he had just performed or prepared the chorus for a revival of Perry's uh, oratorio, Judith. And uh, someone had mentioned to him about De Profundis that it was a work that he ought to take a look at. So he set his folks out to see if they could find performance material for that, and they couldn't. Fortunately, with the power of the internet, they found the English Heritage Music Series website, they found the source for the material, and they locked that in for their program. Now, we had to do some fine tuning for them. First of all, as Matthew mentioned, this piece is for 12 part chorus, uh, which is a bit of a challenge both for the conductor and for the singers. So we put together uh, MP3 uh, uh, audio tracks for all 12 parts so that the chorus could uh, rehearse uh, the, the piece uh, at home. In addition, the UK has different print standards for the size of vocal scores and part scores and conductor scores, so we had to resize everything. But we did so gladly because to know that this work, which was originally premiered in 1891, was finally going to get another hearing, uh, we said we'll do whatever it takes. Um, as we mentioned, the performance was on February 26th last month. Sadly, I couldn't make it over there, but I really wish that I could. Nevertheless, they were kind enough to record it, go through the expense of recording the work. We don't have time here today, obviously, to listen to the entire work, but it is up on our website. So if you go, as Matthew showed you, uh, and access the De Profundis link, you will find at the bottom of the page all four movements as performed at Herefordshire uh, Chorus at St. Albans Cathedral uh, in England last month. But we can give you a little taste of the music. And here we go. <laughs> and welcome to the University of Minnesota Music Library. My name is Jessica Abazio, and I'm the Music Librarian with the University Libraries. The Music Library is located in the basement of Ferguson Hall, the same building as the School of Music, and our collections are tailored to the specific needs of musicians. We offer a wide range of scores, parts for chamber ensembles, books, and journals. We're the home for everything from biographies of Mozart, to scores of operas by Puccini, to scores and recordings of tangos by Piazzolla. We also have over 30,000 CDs, 
close to 3,000 DVDs, and thousands of LPs. These collections include everything from orchestral music, to Broadway musicals, to Prince albums, to Beatles recordings, to jazz and world music. In addition to all of the items that you can find on the Music Library shelves, we also offer many digital resources, like databases for finding articles and dissertations, to streaming platforms that include audio and video not available on YouTube. Students, faculty, and staff of the U of M can log into these digital tools from anywhere in the world. And while these resources are not accessible off campus by members of the wider community, anyone can visit our space and ask for a guest user card, which will allow access to our computers for two hours a day. We lend many of our music library materials to members of the community through interlibrary loan. Ask about this service at your local public library to get started borrowing today. We do provide direct borrowing privileges to members of the Friends of the Libraries. As a friend, you can also enjoy unlimited access to electronic journals, magazines, and newspaper subscriptions from the computers at any Twin Cities campus library. The University of Minnesota School of Music is home to both performers and researchers, and the Music Library supports their teaching and learning by providing access to resources and scholarship from all over the globe. We visit classes to teach students about how to navigate the library and our digital catalog. We provide expert level reference services for all kinds of music research. And we develop music collections that represent a wide range of perspectives and identities. We also collaborate with students and faculty on special projects like the English Heritage Music Series. When Professor Mahaffey and Mr. Fielding had questions about how to share the scores that make up this series and how to make them discoverable by the wider musical community, they asked if the libraries could help. By connecting them with our digital arts, sciences, and humanities team, and then with University Libraries Publishing, we were able to support the publication of these materials and make them available to the entire world for free. Libraries Publishing supports the creation of scholarly publications on campus. They publish journals, books, dynamic scholarly serials, and textbooks. And among other things, they strive to decrease the cost of higher education for students through the production and integration of open content into course curriculum. This has just been a quick tour of the music library and the rich materials we have to offer. We're open to everyone, even if you're not a student, faculty, or staff member at the U, and we hope that you'll come and visit us in person soon. Well, I'm so glad Jessica could join us today, virtually, and provide such a wonderful overview of the music library. Thank you, Jessica. I'd also like to thank Dave, Matt, Bradley, our pianist, Yi Chen Liang, our soloist, Ji Min Li, and all the talented university singers for enlightening us and entertaining us this afternoon. I'm also grateful to each of you who came here today. We appreciate each and every one of you and our friends of the, of the university libraries. And if you're not a friend, or not yet officially a friend, please do consider being a member. Information about supporting the friends is on page seven of your program. The friends support our libraries, our staff, and student employees, as well as our event series Friends Forum, a series for curious minds. Our next Friends Forum event is coming right up. On April 7th, um, poet and author David Mura will present at our 13th annual Pancake Poetry Reading. Ed Bach Lee, a previous Pancake Poetry presenter, will be our moderator. It's free, it'll be in person, and I hope to see you there. After our next performance, please join us for refreshments in the lobby. And for those of you who are interested in seeing some of the materials discussed today, there will be examples for viewing. And Matthew, Bradley, and Dave will be available to answer questions in the reception room. 
So let me now turn it over to Bradley to announce our closing number. Thank you all so very much. Sir Arthur Sullivan will be famous forever as the composer of The Pirates of Penzance, HMS Pinafore, and 12 other operettas with his collaborator, librettist W.S. Gilbert. But he also composed 10 choral works, 11 orchestral pieces, some ballets, incidental music for plays, and more than 70 anthems and hymns. Sullivan's first opera, The Sapphire Necklace, was written to a libretto by Henry Chorley. And according to lore, the libretto was difficult. So difficult, apparently, that the opera was never performed. The libretto and most of the score are lost. But one piece from the opera was tucked away due to the Victorians' fondness for parlor music. So before we all go, here is Arthur Sullivan's madrigal, When Love and Beauty to be Married Go, now preserved in a fully engraved score in the English Heritage Music Series, available free to the entire world for performance. When love and beauty to be